experience for me as well. And, and thank you very much, John, for joining us today and taking the time out of your busy schedule to speak about something that I know is equally important to you as it is to us at Headstrong, and that's mental health and uh, and addiction. And, you know, I think that's, um, you're, you're charting that as well. So I'd like to, um, to get this started a little bit and, and maybe just share about what you're seeing right now in, in our community. Yeah, thanks, uh, Pamela, for the invitation. Um, and certainly, it's, it is crazy that we've never met one another. It's uh, ships in the ships in the night, uh, certainly know a lot about you and uh, really uh, encourage that you've you've taken on this headstrong initiative and uh, focusing on on mental health and certainly with our business community uh, because it is a, a huge need right now and it is something that uh, I am seeing every single day uh, within within the not only here in my riding but, but across the country as well. Right. So, do you, are there any? Uh, um, I know you're working a lot directly with agriculture uh, in the farming community. Are there any things that you're finding right now are uh, top of mind and um, that we should be paying attention to? You know, I, when, when we did start the Headstrong program, um, rural Alberta obviously was the uh, the focus for me personally and making sure that we're we're filling that gap. But when it comes specifically to our farming community. Um, what's happening there? What are what's what's the conversation look like? Is there a conversation? Well, I think I, I think that's the most important thing that you you hammered on at the end, Pamela. Is is there a conversation? Uh, you know, those of us who who grew up in in the rural communities, you know, the, the comments always been cowboy up, right? Don't don't talk about your problems. Um, you know, especially as, as a as a guy, it's been uh, you know blow some blow on it and uh, put some dirt on it and get up and, and move on. So for a long time, we just never talked about these issues. And I think a lot of it came to the head of, of those of you who kind of went through the 2013 flood. And, and we know the impact that that had on, on our communities and especially our business owners um, and certainly people in rural communities. Uh, and when I, when I saw that and, and how that impacted, and in many ways, seven years later, we're still going through the, uh, those mental health challenges that were a result of that flood. I didn't want to see us have to go through that again when the pandemic hit. Now, of course we are, but I'm hoping that we're being proactive as, as these types of uh, discussion groups are on how do we address that and how do we ensure that we don't just bottle that up and, and hope uh, that it, we kind of come through this and, and heal on our own because that's not going to happen. Uh, we have to be proactive and come up with solutions uh, because whether it's an agriculture or a small town business or, or a corporation or a home-based business, um, we are all feeling this. And this is the mental health impacts of this pandemic are going to be something that is with us for years to come, vaccine or not. And, and we have to be prepared for that. Yeah, I think you hit on a really great point too, a vaccine or not, that's not gonna take away where we currently are when it comes to mental health and, um, our entrepreneurs and our, the families, uh, the youth, you know, there's a lot of concerns surrounding that. Um, I'm not sure, John, if you have kids in school right now, but I'm, I'm hearing a lot more even in relation to that and the struggles, um, right down even actually to the shaming and the blaming um, when it comes to our, our little people that they're they're bearing this upon their shoulders that unnecessarily I'll be completely honest with you that we're we're putting all this stress on them when I don't know how you feel but um as an adult it's a, it's it's overwhelming to me let alone to somebody who um is just growing up um and going through the normal what we would think would be normal challenges without a pandemic surrounding it when we talk a little bit to, to mental health, then, and I want to talk also a little bit today, if we could, about um, the opioid uh, crisis. Um, where does your passion lie in that? And, and have you always been like that? Just, I want to sh would like you to share freely with us, if you would, um, your thoughts behind that. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I, it comes from personal experience. Um, you know, unfortunately, I've had friends, close friends, pass away from from opioid overdose. Um, you know, and I coached for many years in hockey and, and football in this community, so I've seen some of those young people go through this. But 
what really hammered home for me was uh, several years ago. Well, I shouldn't say several years ago, maybe three or four years ago now. Um, you know, we, we had heard that a friend was was uh, having some issues with fentanyl and uh, tried to track her down. You know, we're looking for her. Uh, no one could find her. So I, I, me and another friend tracked her down to an apartment uh, in Calgary and had to break into the apartment, break into the, the building. And when we opened the, finally got her to open the door and we just saw the condition she was in and it, it was like nothing I'd ever seen. Like, I don't know if I could ever explain the look on my face and the look on her face as, a, as an adult and how quickly she had um, gone down that road. And it, it was shocking to see someone who I knew as a, as a vibrant, you know, successful young adult. Um, and then I took her straight to the South Health Campus and I was thinking, okay, well now there's gonna be help. Um, and I was really shocked when uh, the nurse said, yeah, okay, she's, uh, she's got a fentanyl addiction, but she's an adult, uh, there's really nothing we can do. Um, you know, she's free to go. And I just couldn't believe it. Like that, what, that's, that's it? Um, so thankfully she, she's, uh, she's doing well now. And, um, but it was a long process to, to go through that. And thankfully she had family and, and other friends that, uh, that were there for support. But uh, to see someone uh, who I had known for many, many years go through that and to see how quickly, and this wasn't someone, I guess, which I think is really important that we understand as well when it comes to opioid addiction. This wasn't someone who was living on the street or uh, you know, wasn't working or this was just a regular adult with family um, that for one reason or another uh, made a bad decision and uh, you know, became, became addicted to fentanyl. Uh, you know, this wasn't a heavy drug user in, in, that I knew of. And, and so many of these people are becoming uh, addicted to these opioids for, you know, they had an injury, uh, you know, they were prescribed this by a doctor, you know, many, many reasons. So we have to get this, this preconceived notion out of our head that these are the people you see homeless in downtown Calgary or Okotoks for that matter. For the most part, the vast majority of these people who are addicted to opioids are your friends, your neighbors, your family members that you just don't know what the situation was. And certainly as a result of COVID, we have seen those opioid addiction numbers and the overdoses uh, grow exponentially uh, just because of the stress and anxiety that, that we're all facing right now. And thank you, John, for sharing that. That's a, um, a very personal story to you. And I, I could see the emotion for you in um, really you're trying to save a life, right? And um, get on the other side. And whether that person's an adult or, you know, uh, whatever that looks like, I think there's sometimes a disconnect. And please, no disrespect to uh, the Alberta Health Services. They're overwhelmed and overloaded at this point for sure. Uh, but I do think there's an opportunity for whether it be programs like Headstrong or any of you um, uh, on my screen right now today uh, or that will see this on, on Facebook Live to, to really reach out and either get help for yourself or help for someone else, whether that's mental health or an addiction. This is, um, we were in a crisis, let's be honest here, we were in a crisis prior to this pandemic this is now just um, really taken, uh, brought the awareness to another level. And I guess if there's any blessing in, um, in a pandemic, and I try to find the blessings where I can, is, is that we now can look at it blatantly and say, we have to do something. We now have to take action. We can't uh, be about, none of us can be a bystander any longer. And um, when I was talking to my team just before we came on here, Connie and Cynthia, I was saying, I'm feeling quite passionate today. So, um, and I am because I think uh, we need to look after each other and we need, we need to step up and we need to step into the arena, whatever format you wanna put that on and having folks like John and all of you just attending today. I can't even tell you how much that means to me personally, that you wanna be part of that change. You wanna make the difference. You wanna support yourselves and others. So John, do you find that um, there's being significant action taken now when it comes to either addiction or mental health? Do you, do you feel that we're moving the dial? I wanna say yes and no. I think there have been um, some good successes. Uh, you know, here in Alberta, for example, we, know, we now have a Minister of Mental Health and Addictions, which is one of the first times any province has done that, which I think 
uh, is a fantastic step in the right direction. Uh, some real strong investments into actual treatment beds. Where I think we are failing, unfortunately, Pamela, is a little bit because of our system where you have, you know, federal jurisdiction, provincial jurisdiction, you, you can't step on each other's toes. But I think that over the last several months, um, we've developed a, a chair a working group uh, on opioid addiction and mental health in, in Parliament. And, you know, we have spoken to experts uh, from around the world, not just across Canada. And I think what we what I see in Canada is our problem is there's no consistency in uh, how we offer these programs, how they're funded, but there's also no metrics in terms of measuring success. Uh, I, I think that's not a shortage of money necessarily. I think there's money out there for these groups to get a hold of. The problem is there's no accountability and, and no metrics to measure success. So if someone go, well, I guess it's, it's accessing those programs, number one. Um, again, there's that stigma side of it. Uh, you know, how do, what program do I go to? How do I know which one works? So I think for us on, on the federal level, we're trying to, we've come up with a couple of ideas where I think will be uh, extremely helpful if we can implement, uh, implement these, this legislation or these regulations or these tools um, that will help improve, improve the system. So yes, I think we are talking about this much more, which is so critical, uh, but now I think the next step comes um, is finding those partners between public, private, and NGOs and government that will, that will ensure that we're successful. Okay, great. And, you know, we're, we're incredibly grateful here at Headstrong that we had the support from um, the, the government of Alberta and to move forward and, and make this a priority and that um, folks like you seeing that that needed to happen, right? It wasn't, it wasn't optional. Um, now your riding goes down all the way down to Pincher Creek, am I correct? Down to the U.S. border, yeah. Down to the U.S. border. So are you finding um, this to be the same throughout all of rural? Are you, the, the story, the, I guess the, the landscape looks the same? Yeah, I think it's, it's pretty consistent uh, no matter where you are in the country. I think those of us in, in Western Canada, uh, we certainly have a, a much larger challenge when it comes to the opioid crisis. Um, you know, the, the vast majority of that is is illegally imported through China. So, you know, whereas it works its way across the country, we are um, much more acute in, in seeing the opioid um, uh, addiction as more of a crisis. But uh, when it comes to the, the mental health issue, um, you know, there's not a part of my riding that hasn't been impacted for one reason or another. Uh, certainly the pandemic has... Um, you know, not too many people have, have not been impacted that in some way. Um, but, you know, I, I guess there, the, the biggest difference would be uh, rural and urban and your, your ability to access programs or help. Um, and obviously in the rural area, it's not as easy. And um, that's something I think we need to try to, to address as well. And that's why programs such as, as Headstrong are, are so important that uh, you are have a rural focus and, and you're out there with, uh, with these communities. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. And my personal goal is that we're able, I know there's still gaps. I, I know that there's still communities, um, hamlets, areas like that, that we're not being able to get to. Uh, uh, and I know we have a whole bunch of people watching us right now, but I'm just going to lean into you a little bit for your level of expertise and uh, your words of wisdom. How can we reach rural, rural areas? How do we reach, um, not to take away from the brick and mortar, trust me, I shop there all the time, <laughs> uh, but from really the, the farmer in the combine that's sitting by himself wondering what he's going to do, how do I reach him? Well, you know, there are some really good programs that are that are out there now, and one that comes to mind is Do More Ag. If, if, if uh, your listeners or viewers here today haven't heard of that, please look it up. Uh, this is a group that is driven by producers, um, many of them young uh, women farmers uh, that are that are driving this program, uh, and they have uh, support from uh, groups like like uh, like Cargill and, and and some of our large uh, farm companies who are are supporting them. Uh, so I, I think we're finally seeing that that uh, those programs driven by the producers and the farm families themselves, uh, because it's really hard to to connect with them if you don't really understand what you know, what their challenges are, you're rural, you're remote, uh, 
you know, the, for us at the federal level, I think the number one thing that we have to do is intrude, improve rural uh, broadband internet access. So it's hard for you to offer these programs to many of these rural communities that literally don't have the ability to access it. Um, and I think that's, you know, maybe one of the silver linings of COVID is we now have a better understanding how critically important of a utility a high-speed internet has become. Um, you are needing this not only to do business or your kids are in school, but also to access those, those critical programs, whether it's, it's you know, your mental health, uh, physical health. Um, so for us, I think that's step number one is, uh, is improving that, that critical infrastructure. Uh, and the next thing is, and I, and I think this is something that has to change, is you know, we've seen it really in the energy sector where um, you know, people in the energy sector have been attacked by the activists and, and whatnot, and whether you you're, uh, agree with that or not. But now we're seeing agriculture being sort of that next target, uh, where activists are, you know, whether it's cow farts or, uh, you know, glyphosate, all of these different things. So farmers are kind of now they're saying, you know what, we do everything we possibly can uh, to put food on the table. We don't even, we don't only feed our country, but we can Canadian farmers feed the world. And they have gone over and above uh, to, to protect their, their, uh, their land, their soil, their livestock. So there's a real disconnect. And again, it's kind of that urban rural thing. Uh, so I really want people to start to understand what modern Canadian agriculture is and what these farm families do. Um, and these are our most important stewards of the land, our conservationists. Uh, they would never do anything that would um, put you know, their customers in danger. So I think that's something that's really important too, is, is for more Canadians to have an understanding of what that rural farm life is like. I love that. And I can't agree more with you. I mean, I'm a, I'm a farm kid for many years. So I grew up uh, uh, between Vulcan and Natton and it is a different life. And it's, um, it is very different than, uh, than the urban. Oh. What do you feel like, I'm going to put myself in the hot seat because, you know, it's Friday afternoon and, and what better to do that with. What do you need from Headstrong? What do you need from me? What do you need from the people on that are listening to this right now that you feel that we can put into action today uh, to support that mental health um, and, the, and the opioid crisis? What, what, what do we need to do? I think the first thing is, you know, when you, you talked about farming uh, and reach, reach out to those, those farm families, make them feel like they're included. Uh, you know, they are business owners uh, and many of them don't think of themselves as that, but uh, let's be honest, these are small corporations now uh, with millions of dollars in assets, but also <laughs> millions of dollars in, in debt. So uh, reach out to them if, if it include them in, in these types of discussions. And many times they just don't feel like they fit. And, and they, the, as farm families, they also have to change their minds. And they are because we, we are starting to see these young uh, farm entrepreneurs that, that see this as a legitimate career opportunity and you see the technology that's involved. So that would be, that would be the first. The second thing I would say is, is work hard to reduce that stigma around uh, opioid addictions and substance abuse. The numbers that we are seeing now um, from the Canadian Mental Health Association, they did a, a very large survey uh, that came out in December uh, and the numbers are sobering. When you have 70% of Canadians have now felt that their mental health has deteriorated, uh, substance abuse is up 20%, domestic abuse is up 13%, 10% uh, of Canadians are having suicidal thoughts. Like those numbers are frightening. Uh, so it, it is really imperative for your, your group is to be proactive and talk about these things like they're normal because they are. Uh, this is a normal part of our life now. And uh, it, is not going, it is not going to end when we get a vaccine or lockdowns are over. Uh, as much as I don't, you know, not a, not a fan of the lockdowns uh, because of the mental health impact that it has. Um, but you know, talk to your friends, talk to your neighbors and just ask, are you okay? Hey, I'm thinking about you. Because um, a lot of times we don't, we, don't, we don't talk about this enough. And I think that's the biggest thing is, is remove the stigma about being comfortable about talking about these issues. And it is a normal part of your life. And we just can't, um, we can't ignore that. Absolutely. I love that. Thank you, John. And, and I agree 100%. The stigma around mental health and really the misdiagnosis around mental health is, um, 
unbelievable when you think of, you know, uh, maybe I'm old school, but when back in the day when I thought mental health, you you associated with a disorder or, mm. or some sort of illness um, that is permanent. And that's not the case, you know, uh, I'm just going to call it and everybody, all of us here today at some point, we have gone through and continue to go through struggles, right? And mental health struggles and, and adversity and, and to understand, like to echo what you said, John, it's just, it's part of life, right? Whether it's a pandemic or not, this is, um, this is something we need to be talking about more openly and more freely and having that uh, acceptance, right? And um, thank you and Cynthia, you know, um, just in the mindset alone, right? So um, Connie, is there any anything that you would like to add before we let John go on with his day? <laughs> well, no, John, I just wanna say thank you so much. I really have enjoyed hearing your thoughts. I couldn't agree more, you know, that we can't forget those who are living out there in isolation. I really connected with that. And actually Pamela was talking with our team just before we came on here and we were thinking about how do we reach people that was our question and I was so I was so um, uh, pleased when Pamela asked you that and you know one of the things that we just thought of is that we just need to get on the phone we just need to get on the phone and and call how are you how are you doing uh, really try to keep connection as our goal right now and, and one of the things that we were discussing is, is some of the programs we have coming up next week. We're starting our real talk for rural Alberta. And one of the talks that we're doing is on addiction and suicide and stigma. Those are the three things we talk about in that. And also how to manage your stress and your business. And if I could send out a rally call to everyone here on the webinar, but also in a, on, on Facebook Live and just say, if you have resonated with anything that John and Pamela have said in this time, we need you. We need you to rally around this cause of, of no one left behind, reaching the one. Would you be willing to come next week and bring a friend, bring somebody? Because, you know, it's one thing to hear it on a webinar. It's another thing to actually, well, how do I do that? And if, and if somebody... If I called up someone and asked them, how are they doing? They said, actually, I'm addicted. <laughs> I'm on fentanyl. Now what? What do I do? Well, we have an answer. Would you bring them? Would you say, let's do this together? Let's have no one left behind. I think that the next week is just such a great opportunity to apply everything that has been mentioned here today. Thanks so much, Connie, for, for those final words and, um, and rallying the troops. And that's how we're going to get through this together, right? And, and make the new norm, I have a problem with that term, but if we can make the new norm um, healthier and make it a healthier tomorrow and a healthier community for everyone, um, that I know from me in my heart that that's what my goal is in this program and, and in my life. So I just like to uh, thank John so much for your time. And it was great to finally even if we're only on a screen, right. <laughs> sit yeah. with you for 30 minutes. And, um, and I applaud you, John, for everything you're doing within the communities. And we need more, we need more folks like you out there uh, doing the good work. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending today. And uh, just to echo what Connie said, please, uh, let's rally together and, and get her done. Get her done like we do, right, here in Alberta. So... Um, God bless everybody. Take care, much love, and we'll talk to you all soon.